So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, sustainability seminar. My name is Nancy Holm. I'm the assistant director here at ISTC and seminar organizer along with Beth uh, Mischewski. In case you uh, cannot attend the seminars in person, um, all of our seminars are broadcast live and also recorded and archived on our website. It usually takes about a week for the videos to be posted after the presentation date. So I want to welcome everyone here uh, at ISTC in the audience and those listening online today. Uh, for those here, please uh, be sure to silence your cell phones before we begin. And also, I'll ask that we hold all questions for the speakers until the end of uh, his presentation, and then I'll come around to the microphone here to those in attendance for questions, and then um, we will read those uh, uh, from those viewing online. So you can just type your questions in at any time, and then we'll answer those at the end. So I'm very pleased today to introduce as our speaker David Hughes from American Water, and he's going to be giving his presentation from his office in New Jersey. Uh, David has been uh, a water research manager at American Water since September 2004. Prior to that, he worked as a hydraulic engineer for Aqua America and as a senior engineer for the Water Research Center, a UK-based water and wastewater research and consulting firm. He was in their uh, Philadelphia-based office. David received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. So today, David's going to describe a project uh, on reduction of non-revenue water through continuous uh, acoustic monitoring. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming David Hughes. And David, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Nancy. I hope that applause was for, for you, Nancy. I'm not there. Good. Have you turned it over to me? Yes. Okay. So you're seeing my screen. I just I didn't get a a click to uh, to engage. All right. Sorry for a little confusion there. Uh, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center for allowing me to present and also for allowing us the opportunity with some funding to uh, to test what I think is a very uh, exciting and innovative advance in uh, continuous acoustic monitoring. Uh, and, and with that, I'll just get uh, right to the slides. Um, the presentation basically will consist of a couple of parts. I want to first set the table and describe what acoustic monitoring is, how it works, um, and some of the, the developments as, as it has evolved as any technology would. It just seems to, to get better and more dynamic. And uh, then talk about the Way Sinden project. Uh, uh, that took place in Mount Prospect, uh, Illinois, that uh, enabled us to uh, further advance and test the, the units before they became uh, uh, a fully saleable product that is available now for water utilities. Talk a little bit about um, what we thought was an important component to this project, which was the cost modeling uh, to try to help utilities evaluate uh, and make the business case for uh, acoustic monitoring. It's not for everybody, but there are some particular situations where it certainly will be applicable and highly beneficial in reducing uh, water leakage. Um, and then uh, throw in uh, just a, a little bit of an update on some of the work that has gone on since this project concluded last June. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll look at your questions. Um, American Water is a uh, pretty substantial uh, operation. We have about 300 water systems that we own and operate, um, serving millions of people across many states, uh, and obviously including uh, Illinois. And if you look there at the very top, uh, we've uh, highlighted the location of the test area uh, in, uh, in northern Illinois in what we call our Metro Chicago district. And as you note on the slide here, that we have uh, uh, a considerable amount of water loss every year uh, through 47,000 miles of Maine, and that's a little mind-boggling to uh, 
to uh, follow in terms of how many miles and miles of various types of pipe, anything from, uh, geez, one inch all the way up to, uh, I believe, uh, we're now up at uh, 84 inches. And uh, the water loss is substantial, and we try any number of solutions to, uh, to address it. And I guess I don't have to talk too much if, uh, if there are utility people out in the audience about uh, pipe leakage and water loss and what it means to their system, but here's just a quick uh, summary of uh, the, the things that are involved when you've got leaks. Uh, obviously, you've produced a water or you've purchased a water, and you're essentially throwing away the investment in treating that and uh, bringing it to wherever that uh, leak is occurring. Um, you're not selling it. That's why it's called non-revenue water. It's, it's not uh, earning money uh, for the utility. It's not uh, something that the customer is paying for directly but indirectly because it does cost money to, uh, to generate. Uh, when leaks occur, uh, repairs ha have to ensue. Um, excavation, restoration, repair, all of those have costs. Um, and leaks, as you can see from some of these pictures, can uh, definitely weaken uh, infrastructure, damage property, and uh, certainly there's also the risk of uh, impacting uh, the quality of the water, uh, especially if we have to perform uh, emergency shutdowns and so forth. Uh, the key statement here, though, is the last one, and that is that most water loss does not come from those dynamic huge breaks that you see on the news all the time. More typically, it's uh, the, the major feature is uh, the small leak, the leak that doesn't show up, that uh, remains subsurface for an extended period of time, uh, finding their way to a storm sewer or to a, uh, an underground aquifer or a or even a, even a local river uh, without coming to the surface. These run day after day, and it doesn't take much imagination, even a gallon a minute leak running 1,440 minutes a day for multiple days can really add up, and that seems to be the, uh, the case in most of uh, uh, the water systems in the United States. Now, there are a couple of ways that we can address water leak detection, uh, and one of the ways is the continuous leak survey. You see a young lady there, what she's doing is putting a probe onto a pipe, and it's, it's literally a, like a stethoscope. She is actually listening to hear if there's sound. What she should also be doing, though, is looking at the box that she has in her hand that probably has a readout because sometimes water leak noise can be below the uh, hearing ability of the human ear. So this is uh, an important piece of, uh, uh, of dynamics. It's typically done at night uh, when there's low flow, low traffic, and other noises uh, are, are minimized. Uh, the, the second technique uh, I'll just highlight real quickly here is called district metering. And what, what you're doing is you're watching water go into a confined area it can be a small water system. Uh, more typically, it's sort of a zoned off area in a larger system. And what you see here is a graph that's actually showing you eight days. And you see what uh, looks like two days of a very repetitive pattern at the, at the far left of this graph. And what that's showing you is a, more or less a typical day. And you see how the water the green lines represent midnight, if you will. So the green line, very low flow, goes down to a minimum somewhere around 3 o'clock in the morning, slowly builds in the morning, and actually peaks typically in most systems at 7 or 8 o'clock at night, um, drops down uh, as people go off to work, and maybe there's some wash, and maybe there's some other local activity going on in, in this, as it happens to be a residential neighborhood. Uh, peaks again and somewhere around the, the dinner hour and then drops off again. But if you notice in the third window there, all of a sudden things seem to go wrong. Uh, this was a, an unexpected operational problem that first caused a drop in the pressure. And then you can actually see almost a straight vertical line uh, going up to the top there. And that's basically a leak. And the orange line is actually showing you that minimum night flow and you can see how it has jumped up and it actually jumped up in the middle of the leak if you notice uh, 
in the in that third day in the in the fourth day it's uh, it's at its peak and then you can also and this is what's interesting we can also tell you when the repair was made or at least when the water was shut off uh, to uh, to stop the leak as you can see it dropped back down but notice also that it hasn't dropped all the way back down so it could be that whatever happened in this water system it's it's more than one leak or it's a leak that uh, might have partially returned in, in some fashion and then later on as you progress through this you can see that uh, they had another uh, event where they did drop the water loss a, a little bit more so this is by studying these graphs you can actually know when it's time to send out your leak detection people to go looking for leaks either for visible signs or as uh, as we would shown before with these uh, conventional leak survey types of devices. Now the area that we're going to talk about now is is the continuous acoustic monitoring and what this does is instead of having a person going from place to place in the middle of the night what we're actually doing is we're putting monitors out in the field and what they're going to do is listen every night and not just do this once every year or couple of years but every night and give you a permanent location and on the right hand side here you can see a couple of the devices uh, the first one is actually the one that is uh, in the upper left of those four uh, four photos uh, that is actually strapped to the service line uh, the subsequent models in from other companies uh, basically are attached magnetically to the top of the valves that are buried underneath the ground. They, you, you have access points uh, and you can drop them down into the box and they can transmit signals and give you information about the noise that is being generated. Uh, American Water was actually the pioneer of this. Uh, we were the first ones to work with some vendors to combining uh, the acoustic monitoring skills with uh, what's called advanced metering infrastructure, the AMI systems, the way that we read meters uh, by uh, having information sent by radio to towers and are collected. We're using those same devices for communication to uh, receive noise information. Uh, and the product that we're going to talk about today actually started conceptually back in 2009. So this is a this is a product that has been uh, five or six years in the making. So how does this work exactly? Well, what happens is that the, the, the unit itself is programmed to go and, and work for a particular window in the middle of the night. And what it's trying to do is find the, the, the quietest period it possibly can. Because the thing about leaks is that they don't stop. They make noise all the time. And the, the data is then interpreted uh, using various types of analytics and checked for particular frequencies that are common to to leaks and leaks do make different kinds of noises uh, the more uh, metallic units will or the metallic pipe will generate a much sharper signal than the plastic which tends to dull the signal for example uh, and anyway what what then happens is that this information is transferred by the acoustic monitoring company to the so-called cloud, uh, an FTP site, where the utility can view it and essentially uh, the following day get a chance to see what kind of noise and changes in noise were generated. And significant changes in noise are usually noted in sort of a, uh, a dashboard kind of a, a uh, cover of the uh, uh, of the program itself so the first thing you see when you come on the cloud or you know here are the places that are making noise now and then you can drill down and, and look at the data and we'll show you some examples of that uh, later in in the presentation so the first study that we did this innovation uh, going back it happened in a small town in, in southwestern Pennsylvania called Connellsville a very hilly region as you can see from the the photos, uh, an, an old town. Uh, most of the pipe is over 100 years old uh, to this day, and we continue to monitor it. In fact, since the, the devices were installed in 2005, they continue to work. Um, 
And what we were faced with here was a system that was very leaky, understandably, with such old pipe. And uh, what complicated the matter for them is that they didn't make their own water. They purchased it from another company. And when you pay another company for finished water, it tends to be the most expensive water that, uh, that is out there amongst our many systems. And the results that we got right off the top were very encouraging. The, the system was basically installed in May of 2005, and in, a, in six, seven short months, we found 46 leaks, whereas in the previous years, we were averaging less than 20 repairs at a time. Um, and about half of those leaks were identified by the acoustic monitors and repaired before they surfaced. And some additional leaks were also found but they did surface before the, the repair was made because there were so many, it took us a while to get around to all of them. But that did allow us to get some sense with that project about how long leaks tend to stay underground. We did have one leak that we allowed to run, and it literally ran for over a year. And uh, we never actually uh, uh, made the repair. We simply shut off the line. It was a an experiment to see how long a, a leak might uh, run underground and, and we picked a good one because it was over a year and it would have continued to run for who knows how long beyond that. The good news, uh, we cut our water use of a system that was generally pumping about a million and a quarter gallons per day down to a million gallons a day. And so you're saying, boy, this is, this is great stuff. We should be going all after this. And then we went and made this a three-year study. And here's what we found afterwards, uh, that uh, while we had a great year the first year, we then encountered a very bad winter, actually two very bad winters. And despite the fact that the graph says the non-revenue water went up considerably, the reality was that we were actually finding more leaks and stopping more water flow in those years. And one of the difficult things about uh, evaluating uh, non-revenue water uh, uh, treatment processes, whether it's reducing pressure or acoustic monitoring, is that you can't really say this would have happened if I hadn't done it because you really can't create a, a parallel universe to analyze it. But what we did was we quantified the flow coming out of leaks that were identified by the uh, acoustic monitors and that 1,394 gallons per minute in 2007 is, is the equivalent of more than 2 million gallons per day. So when we looked at the data and how well these syst the, the system worked, we looked at it in, in, in two parts. So the first we called coverage, which was how many leaks did the unit was the unit capable of finding in the first place. We found that almost 20 percent of the leaks could not have been detected because they just simply came to the surface from, from what we can tell uh, immediately. And some of them were repaired immediately, even before they generated acoustic noise. Um, and then in, in addition to that, we did have some locations in this uh, water system that uh, were out of range of some of our uh, monitor units, or the monitor units in, in a few rare cases actually failed from time to time. Uh, then we take the balance of those units, uh, of the, these 131 leaks that we felt we could have covered. We found that uh, more than half we, we actually did find and made the repairs before surfacing. So it was a better than a 50% batting average. And we also found another uh, roughly uh, half of the remaining units that were um, uh, actually repair, although we had detected an acoustic signal that suggested that there might have been a leak. But that left uh, literally a third of the units that uh, where we could see water running down the street and our acoustic monitors weren't working at all. And I've given you a little bit of a graphic uh, there on the lower right hand corner. You can see a pipeline and imagine that the, the piece, that blue piece in the middle, was the same as the rest of the pipe, a, a steel or a, 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 a cast iron pipe that was probably 80, 100 years old. And it, it was so corroded that we couldn't just simply put a patch on it. We had to actually cut out an entire section. So when you cut out a section 
and you put repair clamps and you see two of them there holding the, the new pipe in place, uh, typically what happens is the, uh, the repair piece is plastic and not uh, uh, a metal. And this discontinuity of materials causes loss of signal of sound with the particular monitors that we had installed. So we, we, we had a couple of issues in addition to that. We, we also encountered uh, what we call false positives, where while the units were good at picking up leaks, they were also good at picking up other extraneous noises uh, that uh, could be um, electric generators, heaters, air conditioners. We found most of our problems would occur in the hot summer or the cold winter when there was a lot of mechanical activity going on in the town. This gets us, I guess, into the first part of what I want to call the uh, economics of leakage uh, and the recognition that leaks, any leak costs you money, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend $50,000 on equipment if you're only going to save uh, $3,000 worth of leaks on a yearly basis. The payback just isn't there. And unfortunately, in some situations, it is far less expensive to let a leak run or wait until it comes to the surface because water, uh, and particularly in groundwater systems, are, is fairly inexpensive. So you need to be aware of the cost of the water. We have some systems where water is so precious that we really can't afford to lose any of the water and we need to watch it very carefully that water isn't really, the, the cost of it isn't really reflected in how much it costs to make it. It's more in how much it, how much could we actually sell it for, the real retail cost of the water, if you will. So, um, and, and in the case of the system we're going to be looking at today in, in uh, Illinois, the, the issue is uh, that the water there also is purchased like it was in Connellsville, so it's, it tends to be fairly expensive. And there's a there's a good incentive to uh, to pursue a system uh, such as the acoustic monitoring system we're going to be looking at, and how effective uh, we are at um, reducing the leakage with these units also depends on the leaks themselves. If leaks come to the surface right away, uh, there really is no merit in the acoustic monitoring to save a day or two, as opposed to days, weeks, months of, uh, of hidden leakage is considerable. And the last point I wanted to make in this, uh, on this uh, slide was that we found, um, and this goes back to the, the leak surveys where you send a person out uh, maybe once a year, we found when we actually did a good job with the acoustic monitoring that we would make all the repairs and the system would start springing leaks again and the, the really kind of a simple dynamic involved here. If you've got a system that's leaking, think of all of those little leaks as pressure relief valves. They're keeping the pressure from building up. If you suddenly stop all the leaks, the system goes to a higher pressure than it's been before and up pops some more leaks. So uh, we've, we found some real value in systems that are leak prone um, where the leaks remain hidden to, uh, to use something like acoustic monitoring to stay after the system, if you will. Now, the, the benefits of the fixed leak monitoring, and, and this initially came out of the, our very first study, but uh, we, we've now gone beyond that. Uh, but what, what are the benefits? You know, I, I, obviously, there's going to be savings in, in the amount of water that you either have to buy or produce. Um, if there is some evidence, and we'll have a, a, an example today of finding a leak early enough that it avoided a significantly bad, uh, a much worse break than, than the one that we actually ended up repairing. Uh, and certainly that has some issues relating to property damage and publicity and the like. Um, obviously, if we can get to a pipe and repair it sooner, faster, uh, with less undermining of the road and the soils washing away, uh, the cost of repair itself actually go down. And if we have an opportunity to uh, make the repair during a, just a normal working day instead of under emergency conditions, we tend to avoid overtime. Um, 
And for American Water, one of the incentives at the, the beginning of this program was to just find out a way to further justify putting in the automatic meter reading. To give your customers a daily read uh, is, is a very helpful thing, but those systems, especially 10 years ago, were very expensive, and we were looking for a better cost justification for putting the system in. It's sort of the forerunner of what we are now calling the intelligent water system. So let me now talk a little bit uh, about the unit that we actually are, are had put to the test here. Um, we had started some piloting in uh, actually going back to 2010 and 2011 when we were testing some units out in the field, but uh, officially we were really deploying units in 2014. It tended to be a small system when we first started. Uh, what's significant, I think, in this slide is the uh, the seven units per mile. Uh, which is the average density that these units need to be deployed in. Most other systems are running 9, 10 per mile, and that may not seem like a lot, but when you've got a lot of miles per, uh, in your systems, that, that can really add up pretty, pretty quickly. And again, as I said before, uh, a communication system with uh, data collectors, and they do a good job of making sure that the information gets transmitted. And the cloud technology, it needs a very good uh, computer system uh, that uh, can do the analytics and a cloud that uh, that the utility can access. And uh, in this particular case, we also need GIS data because we're going to do something called correlation, and we'll get to that here in just a second. Here's a visual of this unit, now, and I had said earlier that the uh, units were either strapped onto the service line or uh, dropped down into the into the valve boxes or onto the top of the valves. Uh, this particular unit uses an approach of putting both the transmission unit uh, for communications and the acoustic monitor inside the cap, the steamer cap, the front cap, if you will, of the fire hydrant that you see here. And how this works is very much like uh, what we had described before. Uh, the sensors basically do their listening uh, at night, uh, as we had talked about before. They generate some data. It's collected uh, through the uh, AMI network. Um, we can actually look at our system, and what uh, the software does is it actually superimposes all the GIS locations of our water mains with information about those mains. And then if a leak is detected, then the uh, system can do something, again, as I mentioned before, correlation to confirm that the leak actually exists and get a better idea where it is. So I know you're asking what in the world is leak noise correlation, and uh, really it's it's a, just a, a, a matter of science. And I'll have a picture here that'll really show this a little bit better. But uh, what we're talking about is that the vibration coming off of a off of a, a leak is traveling at a at a specific speed, and if you can uh, identify that speed, and it's usually a pretty consistent thing through specific materials, if you know what those materials are. You can actually do essentially a triangulation of where the leak is is on the pipe, provided that your sensors are on either side of the of the leak. And let me show you uh, picture-wise. This is actually a field correlator. These are used uh, very often to actually find the leaks in the field without the aid of acoustic monitoring. Um, and, and as you can see here, they're showing the transmitters uh, sending us basically connected to two hydrants, and the computer is actually telling both of those units via a receiver to send out a signal and tell both of those units to listen at exactly the same time. And correlation does require precise timing. They have to be exactly coordinated time-wise, and if that's the case, then you get as that picture shows, and I don't know how well you can see this on, on your graph, but you can see in the center of the of the uh, photograph on the right-hand side, a very high line, which indicates the presence of a leak. And I'll have a couple of better pictures of this. But essentially, what we're talking about with the uh, with the unit from uh, uh, from Mueller, the, uh, the the device, the transmitter, and the uh, and the sensor are both inside the hydrant cap, and the receiver is essentially the communication network, the AMI network. 
So let me give you some real uh, some real examples. This was actually the very first leak that uh, that was actually uh, properly coordinated with what we called an alpha version of this device. This was a not a ready for sale device, but this was a trial uh, set of devices that were put out in a town called Uniontown, Pennsylvania, actually very close to the original site of Connellsville. Uh, th this group was very well experienced working with uh, the technology and we went right back to them. And lo and behold, uh, we got a call from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the vendors saying, hey, we've, we've, we found a leak and, and here's where we think it is. And it was between two fire hydrants that had correlated correctly. And if you look at the graph on the uh, left-hand side, uh, the, the green line is what the sound looked like normally before the leak popped up. And then, as you can see here, this is the, the blue actually shows you what the sound looks like and you can see how the signal if you will kind of peaks and that that peaking indicates that both of the units are hearing the same thing at the same time and it's spiking and that actually is can be translated into giving you the specific location represented by the arrow that you see um, there on the graph on the right and so where do you think the leak was? Well, the leak wasn't there at all. It was actually to the other side. Um, and it turns out that what we thought was a continuous line down Butler Street there that you see on the, uh, on the right, that pipe was actually not connected at all. And what these two fire hydrants were doing were correlating not from uh, the, uh, basically the, the upper right to the lower right, but we're actually going three quarters of the way around that block in, shown in the green and correlating over 1,700 feet, uh, which we had not seen with correlation devices uh, in, in previous uh, models of, uh, of uh, correlating uh, uh, continuous acoustic monitors. This was, uh, this was really something to get excited about. The, uh, the next uh, area that we uh, looked at was in Liberty, Pennsylvania, and this involved a leak that uh, was again pinpointed through the, uh, through the vendor, and they said go out and take a look, and we looked and we couldn't find it, and we looked again and still couldn't find it, and, but if you look at the graph here, and I'll go back, whoops, I'll go back one again this is sort of when they first said that there was a leak it's not very obvious it's a little bit more obvious the second time with a, a much clearer peak and these these graphs are to scale so they're the same scales uh, still nothing after two weeks and then the third week they said you guys really need to go out there we'll come out with you and we'll we'll send our expert to help you find this leak and uh, the leak was actually right where it was supposed to be and this is what the leak looked like you see the crack of the of the pipe on the uh, uh, on the right hand side there that's actually was the bottom of the pipe and the leak was actually running shooting straight down when we dug up the pipe it was dry on the top of the pipe this water was shooting straight down to a local river and was not surfacing at all and cracks like this tend to just continue propagating and cracking over a, perhaps the full 20-foot length of this cast iron pipe. And needless to say, this was an, an example of uh, finding a leak and making a repair before it becomes a catastrophic failure, not to mention how many weeks or months this leak might have run before it was actually discovered. Well, that takes us finally to uh, Way Sindon. It took us a little while to get there, but uh, I, 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 the, the, the trip was worth it. Uh, the units that we put in were very similar to the ones that we had put in uh, in the Liberty, Pennsylvania, the one where we had just found that uh, severe crack on the bottom of the pipe. Uh, a fairly small system, but again, it was purchased water. Uh, they had some leakage. They averaged about a leak a, a month in a in a fairly small system and what was uh, interesting to us about it was that many of the leaks were corrosion type leaks and corrosion leaks tend to be little tiny pinholes in the pipe that tend to uh, to run for an extended period of time without surfacing so 
we felt that this was uh, a, a good case, uh, particularly since many of the highways in this area, very close to uh, O'Hare Airport, uh, were uh, fairly broad and wide and uh, had the potential to hide uh, water leaks. So again, we went to work, and but before we did that, we tried to build ourselves a framework for looking at the savings analysis from leak detection for leaks as they arose. And um, we used a couple of rules and, and, a, and a couple of direct feedback uh, uh, pieces of information from our uh, field people uh, at uh, uh, Illinois American. Uh, first off, um, you, you'll see there that we talked about a 90-day run of, uh, of a leak on average underground. This was based on some of the work that we had done not just in the uh, Connellsville case, but we had deployed some uh, acoustic monitoring in, in other places, uh, largely in New Jersey, and had basically come to the conclusion that, by and large, that the, the, smaller, the smaller family of leaks, on average, will run about 90 days. So that gives us sort of a time frame that we can use when we find these hidden leaks. Uh, we also would query directly the, uh, the field crews and look at their, their cost breakdowns to look for uh, potential reductions in uh, restoration materials. We would be familiar with the type of break and whether or not the break could have gotten much worse over a period of time. Uh, one of the other areas that we looked at was the uh, overtime. Uh, again, understand that we're finding a leak that nobody knows about, and we can take a day or two to, to arrange the crew to get them out there instead of looking at the prospect of maybe going out there in the middle of the night because it's icing up a road or it's, it's a water hazard or the leak is substantial and it demands immediate attention. Uh, so in, uh, in this particular system, they were averaging with their repairs about three overtime hours for every leak, and that includes the leaks that were happening during the regular business day. This was the average that uh, uh, was involved. And the, secondly, or, or finally, we were also looking at any evidence of uh, secondary damage, property damage, and, and, and the like. Uh, it doesn't happen all that often, but again, if we thought that there was some particular uh, vulnerable uh, part of private property or, or a highway, uh, we would have noted it. So the, the system became effective on September 1st, more or less. It might have been a little bit before that, and it's difficult to actually put a date on it because as these units are put in and installed, they need a, a few days to actually normalize, to establish what the background noise and leakage uh, or non-leakage circumstance might be. But it didn't take very long for us to get a very uh, promising leak in terms of something that could save us some money. This was a leak on a six-inch cast iron main. It was actually a, the start of a split on the top of the pipe. But what's interesting here is that the, you can see this repair is being made in the grassy area next to the sidewalk. This was a leak that was running directly into a storm sewer manhole that was right next to the leak. It was not coming up and, and, and going as you might expect that it would with some pressure behind it up to the grass on the top of the ground. And when they lifted the manhole cover, they could uh, actually hear the water inside the manhole but it was not loud enough that you know somebody walking by might actually hear the leak. Uh, the repair was very simple, just a six-inch repair clamp, uh, and uh, it was a, it was a, uh, easily done. Now you'll notice that we didn't repair it until September 24th, and we obviously could have repaired it sooner than that. But again, um, the the uh, Chicago Metro Group were kind enough to let it run for a little while to help us confirm the fact that this was not a leak that was going to come to the surface right away. And as you can see, in a grass area, uh, running for 12 days without coming to the surface is, is certainly notable. So we went to work on the savings analysis, and um, you can look at the breakdown here, but uh, obviously the bulk of the cost was if that leak had run for 90 days and it was running at 25 gallons a minute when it was exposed, uh, and if we had multiplied that out times the cost of the water, it would have equaled $17,000. Uh, $17,000 rep represents 
oh, roughly about 20% uh, of the cost of the acoustic monitoring system itself. So we already, in, in a few short days, had gotten 20% back on the investment that had been made. Uh, in terms of restoration materials, because it was in a grass area, we didn't think that there was going to be any substantial paving or sidewalk collapse or anything like that to, to be encountered. Uh, there was the possibility that there would have been extra repair clamps uh, required because this was a split pipe that could have continued to split more, so there was an allowance for that. The repair labor, and again, it was done on a beautiful day in, in September instead of possibly in the middle of December where water would be cascading over the, uh, the curb line or who knows, this thing might have gone for several years. Hard to, hard to really say, but overall you can see that the total savings we came up with was over $18,000. The next leak we encountered was in uh, uh, the following month, and it was actually a, a plumbing error. There was a, a, a service line that, that sprouted a leak ahead of the shutoff valve, and it took a little while. Unfortunately, this happened on a uh, Friday afternoon, which is when most leaks happen. If, if you know the utility rules, they, they usually happen then. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it did run for a couple of days. But Ecologix, the, the company with the acoustic monitors, didn't detect it. Um, and uh, the problem was that they didn't uh, uh, see the, uh, uh, the leak because of the, the, the battery of the unit that was closest had actually failed. And what they were able to do then was to go back into the history of the, of the leak noise, because they do record history, and find out that uh, adjoining units had they been triggered to the sensitivity, would have actually found the leak. So that tells us that the, that the unit that failed, probably if it had been working or it would have easily found this particular leak. Here's a quick view of the, um, of the software. And as you can see, there's a, there's, there's a nice map. There's, uh, and you can see the, the units highlighted in red showing you where problems are. But I direct your attention to the uh, right-hand side, and you see a graph there. And that graph actually shows in blue what the normal signal is at a particular location. And the yellow is showing you what it is on the day that you're looking at. And there's an actual uh, little toggle there. A couple days earlier, that might have looked like this. Uh, and then later on, it returned and showed evidence of a leak. So you can actually go through and look at the history of ta over time of uh, how these noise patterns, uh, how the noise pattern changes and allows you to evaluate the leaks even more so than just getting an alarm from the, uh, from the vendor. The next leak uh, worth mentioning is one that was a service line leak and we did have a couple and, and the, the system is sensitive enough to pick up service line leaks. This was about a, only a gallon a minute coming out of a box and initially Ecologix did not find this uh, because it was so small, but the good news is that they were able to track it later on, and this is a customer service leak. This is a leak on the on the customer side of the of the curb, if you will, of the shutoff valve, and it's their responsibility to fix it. So how do we know after we've notified the customer that they fixed it? Well, usually we have to roll a truck and go out and check it, and we might have to check it multiple times. In this particular case, the leak detection system actually performed that function, so we actually saved the money of dispatching the truck at least once, if not more times. Uh, in this particular case, the customer fixed it uh, almost within a week. Now, one of the ways that we were actually able to evaluate whether the ecologics were finding all the leaks were we looked at the night flow. And you remember the example we showed with the minimum night flow. We did something very similar here in, uh, in the Way Sinden system, and essentially we were able to have enough evenings, uh, the middle of the night, where the only thing that was going on was that the, a tank was feeding the supply, the very little supply that was needed to meet demand. So you're seeing here a chart over several days of, uh, of what we see in terms of night flow. And every once in a while you might see a, uh, a, a small elevation of the, uh, of, of the curve uh, but uh, for the most part, this was fairly flat and maintained fairly uh, flat conditions across the, uh, the course of the project. 
Now, there were nine other additional leaks, and I certainly don't have time to go through all of those, but uh, these were all uh, main brakes. Uh, they pretty much all six-inch main brakes. But the bad news here was that they were all short-term leaks, they, they, except for maybe one that was a failed battery, and it came to the surface in about three or four days. But, uh, and, and the reason for this was that the water system uh, and this was something that we hadn't really looked at too carefully, unfortunately, was that most of this water system is not under the road. It's actually in the grass area off the road, even in some of the major highways, so that when there was a leak, uh, it didn't have much of a, a an impervious surface to overcome uh, in order to come to the surface. So um, in the end, uh, we really didn't find any other aha. We found another 90-day type of leaks over the course of the 10-month period. But the good news is if the system lasts five years and we've actually saved 20 percent in the first year anyway, we consider this at least a break-even uh, pending further study. I do want to direct your attention to the last leak that we found in the project, and this is four days before the end. Um, don't ask me why, but I was working at 5.30 in the morning. Um, I was out of the office actually and uh, uh, got an email from Illinois American Water saying we've got a really bad leak out there. It started about 10 or 11 o'clock last night. It's been running all night and it's beginning to impact us. We can't keep up with the, the, the demand. Our tank storage is dropping. Can Ecologics, can the vendor come out and find that leak? Uh, before Ecologics got onto the leak, uh, the leak was found on a 12-inch on asbestos cement water main, and this, this actually feeds a major computer center for one of the airlines. It's, it's basically one of the uh, control areas for uh, reservations and all kinds of things, and they have a uh, major water supply to, apparently to cool computers as well as a, as, as a fire system inside with their own private fire hydrants. But look at the water that they lost in, in the course of those seven or eight hours, about 800,000 gallons. This is not non-revenue water. This water went through the meter. Um, and this is one of those lessons learned for customers that have systems like this. And it certainly begs the question, maybe we could put some of these monitors on their system and keep track of that as well. And the reason for doing that was that there really weren't any other hydrants that uh, we had located in that area to monitor uh, and with and you can see there's an orange dot sort of in the upper center of that's where the leak was and notice how close it was to that lake uh, but in the but fortunately it, it did bubble up so that it was visible on the main road going into the into this facility um, but um, all of the hydrants that you see there are sort of those gray circles with uh, the, the little cross-like uh, figures. Those are all fire hydrants, and there's no reason why we could not have actually monitored those as well and made it part of the system. And you can see that this would be uh, extremely valuable for small systems. If uh, Ecologics had had the monitors, they probably could have found that leak had it not been discovered. Uh, within a few hours because of uh, the magnitude of the leak and because of uh, fairly good coverage other than this, unfortunately, this one area for fire hydrants. And again, we, uh, we looked at the, the savings analysis. We especially paid attention to it uh, here in the wintertime. Uh, most of the breaks that we found in the wintertime here were what are called circumferences. Uh, circumferential breaks. That is a, a, a break that goes all that wraps all the way around the pipe, uh, uh, sort of like the you know, a cross section, if you will, of the pipe, as opposed to a little tiny pinhole. Uh, these tend to surface quickly, and that's indeed what they did uh, in, in this case, uh, aided by the lack of you know paving cover. And um, but the uh, the issue here, of course, is the issue of ice as a hazard and the, and the, and the overtime potential. Uh, but again, uh, in the wintertime in particular, where we thought we might be able to uh, justify the, the cost, we really weren't able to do it. And again, it, it had more to do with the physical nature of, of the pipe system. But overall, for the 10 months uh, period, we did figure it was about $18,500. 
uh, including that uh, avoiding that truck trip and one other leak that we might have stopped in a couple of days. Here's a good example of a leak. This leak is actually the the pipeline is actually uh, in the in the sidewalk area, and it's as you can see, it's bubbling up between the sidewalk and the paving, uh, and creating a a pretty nasty hazard. And in Chicago, Illinois, the pipes are fairly deep, uh, which we thought might also help keep the pipes uh, hidden. And you actually see that what they have to do is is shore up, uh, basically put in a box, if you will, to access these pipes. So leaks of any nature tend to have uh, have some expense. Looking now at uh, the cost analysis, uh, again, we didn't really find any uh, cases uh, other than the, the one initial break uh, on Kincaid Court. Uh, not much really to go on, but the, the work has continued at American Water. You see here a, a, a graphic of a deployment in Charleston, West Virginia, right along the Kenanawa River. And uh, there were 400 de units deployed there. Uh, within a month, they found uh, over a dozen leaks, including a leak on a 36-inch main they weren't even monitoring, but it was connected to the other pipes, so uh, the vibration was so loud. The net result was that they reduced the non-revenue water in that system by over 4 million gallons a day. So again, it, it's highly dependent on the nature of the system. This system in a river valley, uh, basically uh, the, the decision was, was to put these units in that uh, right along the, the river, uh, hoping to, to find leaks. And as you can see, and, uh, and in support of the, the premise that we had, that, that leaks just keep popping in, in a system that's fairly weak, we've actually repaired over 60 leaks in, in eight months' time. Another area that uh, we're looking at is uh, allowing this acoustic monitoring system to compete with other systems. This is isn't the only one out there. Uh, there are a few others competing, and we're actually in a, a suburban Pittsburgh with that picture there showing you some of the topography, a very hilly area, a uh, very old pipe, and uh, all of these uh, systems are going to compete with one another uh, to see if they can uh, find uh, leaks. One of the issues that we did discover, not with uh, so much with the uh, uh, Way Sinden system, but with the system in Pittsburgh, or, or rather in yeah in the Pittsburgh area, was that uh, sometimes we have we don't have hydrants at dead ends. Some oftentimes we do, but sometimes we do not. And there's going to be a need to develop a sensor for areas where the hydrants are not located, so we can get full coverage. Uh, we do have a final project uh, report uh, being put out. Uh, it'll have the the cost model information. Uh, we'll outline some of the cost areas that you've seen here, and we'll also talk a little bit about some of the successes we've had in other areas. That, but despite limited success in, in this system, it actually proved to be successful in a number of ways. It helped us find some flaws in, in, the, uh, in the pilot uh, uh, units, uh, and in the end, uh, all of those units with the battery issue were totally replaced with uh, commercially uh, uh, available products, so it's the the system is now fully outfitted, and better than that, the uh, Chicago Metro people are interested in uh, outfitting other systems, despite the limited success here, because they they were impressed with uh, how well it worked. And I guess um, you know, I got some conclusions here, but I want to leave some time for questions, so maybe I can stop right here. Questions? I do not see any questions in the question box. Um, yes, we're having a little technical difficulty here. So uh, I'll ask uh, the audience here first if they have any questions. Chuck Curtis, um, institutional water treatment program, so I deal with systems that are uh, industrial water, but in many of the places I go, uh, they'll have undetected leaks of high temperature hot water or, oh, right. uh, 
you know, different systems like that, or, or they may have a steam system and buried condensate pipes, and the condensate pipes are leaking. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on whether this kind of system would be beneficial, economical for that kind of uh, application? Well, I'm not sure about the steam system. I, you know, obviously, anything that that leaks out of a out of a pipe vibrates, but I don't know that this would actually be a good match for that acoustically. You could probably have that checked by one or more of the vendors that are out there looking at that that type of equipment. The the thing that springs into my head though is that there is a company uh, out in the uh, St. Louis area that does both aerial and uh, drive-by. Uh, using a combination of uh, uh, geothermal and um, ground penetrating radar, and y your big asset here is the, is the heat that's escaping, and that should be something that would be easily tracked uh, by their methodology. It's a little different, and it's certainly not something that most systems would find use for, uh, but it sounds like yours would be better suited to that particular application, I can give you that information if you want to send me an email. Sure. Yes, I will do that. Okay. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions here, and we're not seeing any online. So we want to thank you again, David, uh, for your interesting presentation today and your work on this project uh, so that we can save a lot of this uh, non-revenue water. So thanks yeah. very much. Oh, you're you quite welcome. Any other concluding remarks? Well, I, I do have the, the conclusions that I put up on the screen, and, and I did want to indicate that you know this is not a system that fits everybody, and, and that's just uh, more reason to, to look at the economics of this. And I think hopefully the economic models that we provide are, are useful. I think the difficult part in the economic model, though, is trying to figure out whether you have leaks that tend not to surface, and there are some clues to that. Uh, for instance, if you find a, uh, that when you excavate leaks that there are the, these huge sinkholes and, and, and gaps, that, that, that suggests that a leak's been running a long time. You can obviously look to see in, in particular areas whether or not your, your water loss suddenly drops after it's been so high for a very long period of time. Those are clues that will allow you to, to, to make an evaluation whether or not you've got that kind of a leak. Because that's that's, that's very important. Uh, we, we certainly aren't recommending this for everybody go out and buy one and you know buy these. It's, it's more a, a judicious, uh, deliberate uh, kind of a process for any water utility. Okay. And then uh, are you thinking of installing these in Illinois and any of the other communities here? Yeah, I, as I mentioned, our Metro Chicago group is already in discussions with Ecologix to deploy another system in a, actually a fairly large uh, system in the, within their area. I don't know that that's been announced or anything, but uh, uh, there, there should be something uh, coming out on, on that fairly soon. I do know that uh, um, Illinois in particular uh, in the metro Chicago area does have some high cost water so there are some pockets that uh, would uh, merit this uh, even in your own Champaign Illinois it's a, it's an, an area that we serve and an area with uh, uh, some pretty significant leakage so that one will probably bear some scrutiny as we go forward and is this something that right, American Water evaluates in all of their different communities, is it, is it something that the city would ask for or is it more your um, team in, in each uh, area of the state that would indicate whether they want to try the system? Yeah, it would be, it would be our team and again this is one of the reasons why we, we drive so hard for the economic benefit and the analysis to make sure that uh, you know we satisfy ourselves and the regulators and our public that uh, you know when we go out and buy New toys, if you want to call them that, that uh, you know, that they have value, they add value, they 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 will uh, have a, a desirable impact. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. Um, and for those uh, listening and here, our next seminar will be on November 19th, where we'll be talking to someone from the Shedd Aquarium about their water uh, conservation measures there. So, thank you very much.